This presentation is called The Limits of Reciprocity. And in this presentation, we're going to answer two questions. First, is there a size limit to achieving cooperation through direct reciprocity? And secondly, how does indirect reciprocity differ from direct reciprocity? So we'll also be distinguishing different kinds of reciprocity. So far, we've considered two roads to the evolution of cooperation. And one of these is based on Hamilton's rule and the concept of inclusive fitness and in this framework, close genetic relatedness is fundamental. But we've also now looked at reciprocity. And reciprocity is based on repeated interactions. And in this case, close relatedness isn't important. But the likelihood of interacting again is important. In an earlier presentation, we noted that Hamilton's rule has an outer limit that can be defined very easily. And this is because relatedness falls by one half with each step away from the focal individual that we take. So your child has a 50% likelihood of sharing a gene with you that's identical by descent. By the time you get to your niece or your grandchild, that's halved to 25%. And by the time we get to a first cousin, it's cut in half again to 12.5%. And quite quickly, relatedness approaches zero and is close enough to zero that we can consider it to be zero. So why does that matter? Well, it matters because the level of relatedness affects the cost-benefit ratio that has to be maintained in an altruistic act. So we used a lot of examples where we compared a child to a niece or a nephew, and the difference in relatedness there is only one half. So a child that has a 50% likelihood of sharing a gene with you, a niece a 25% likelihood, and if we add those two nieces together, they're equivalent to one daughter. And that means that the benefit has to be two times greater than the cost. But if we're comparing having a child versus helping a cousin, well, a cousin is just a 12.5% probability of sharing a gene that's identical by descent with you. And that means four cousins are equal to one child. And another way to think of that is that the benefit has to be four times greater than the cost. And if we go out to a second cousin, it takes 16 second cousins to have as much likelihood of sharing a gene that's identical by descent with you as your own child. And that tells us that the benefit has to be 16 times greater than the cost and by the time we're out to a third cousin, now at this point it requires 64 third cousins to have the same probability of sharing a gene that's identical by descent with you as your own child. And that means that the benefit has to be 64 times greater than the cost. And so as relatedness gets lower and lower, we can easily see that it's quite unlikely that we're ever going to assist 64 third cousins in raising their children to offset the loss of one of our children. And so as relatedness gets smaller, Hamilton's rule becomes increasingly weaker. Now, when we look at Axelrod's rule, we know that relatedness isn't critical. But the question is, is there an outer limit to Axelrod's rule that's similar to Hamilton's rule? So let's compare them briefly. In terms of Hamilton's rule, we know that altruism can evolve most easily 
when the value of R is large, and that means when relatedness is high. And there's something parallel to this in Axelrod's rule, which is that altruism can evolve most easily when W is large. And we've defined W as a shadow of the future. And what we're meaning by that is simply what's the likelihood that two agents will interact again? So let's say that this is an altruistic interaction and orange has benefited blue. W defines the probability that they'll ever meet again, which would allow blue to reciprocate the altruistic act to orange. Martin Nowak has provided a simple formula to help us think about the cost and benefits that are involved as the likelihood of interacting is larger or smaller. And this is Martin Nowak. And this rule is simply that W has to be greater than the cost benefit ratio. And you can find this formula and five others in Nowak's chapter in a book called Evolution, Games, and God, The Principle of Cooperation. That'll be on page 101. So what does this little formula mean? Well, let's apply it. So we're talking about the probability of orange meeting blue again. And W stands for the probability that they will interact again. And Nowak's formula says that in order for cooperation to evolve, that probability has to be greater than the cost-benefit ratio of their interaction. And one way that we can think of this then is to say that if our probability of meeting again is only 10%, then the reproductive benefit that we've exchanged has to be 10 times greater than the reproductive cost. And if we increase the probability of meeting again to 20%, now the reproductive benefit has to be more than five times greater than the reproductive cost, but that's smaller than 10 times. And if we increase the probability of meeting again yet again, to 50%, now the reproductive benefit needs only to be more than two times greater than the reproductive cost. And so as our probability of meeting again gets higher, the cost-benefit ratio can be more and more equal. And as our probability of meeting again gets smaller, the cost-benefit ratio gets larger. And this is just like with relatedness, in Hamilton's rule. And what this tells us then is that direct reciprocity also has size limits. Hamilton's rule is limited to interactions among, a, in humans anyway, a relatively small number of close relatives. Well, direct reciprocity centers on pairwise interactions between two agents. And because the probability of their meeting again has to be high for this to work, the plausibility of the model doesn't extend to large groups where the likelihood of any two individuals interacting again is low. And this point has been made over and over again by different theorists. This quote is from a book called A Cooperative Species by Herbert Gintis and Samuel Bowles, and that's from page 63. Now let's consider a foraging camp. And so if we're looking at foragers, and this is a montage on Wikipedia of photos of the Hadza, who are hunter-gatherers in East Africa, who live in camps that average 30 individuals in size and whose total population has grown to a whopping 1,000 people. But how likely it is in such a small society and particularly in camps, that two individuals will interact repeatedly. 
Well, we tend to say that must be pretty high. And if we contrast this, though, to a metropolis, and this is a street scene in Copenhagen, where there's a lot of people on bicycles, we can ask a parallel question, how likely is it that two strangers will meet again in a large city? So let's say that I help you one day, and uh, maybe the rest of our lives will go by and we'll never meet one another again in our daily routines. So in this case, the probability of meeting again might be very low, and that makes it more difficult for direct reciprocity to work. And indeed, when we look at cities, we'll find that altruistic acts between strangers are quite surprising, and they're surprising enough to be newsworthy. So this is an example from November 30th of 2012, when a New York City police officer named Larry DePrimo purchased a pair of boots for a homeless man. The weather was particularly cold and a tourist from Australia observed this and took a photo. She sent the photo to the New York City Police Department with a note commending the officer. The New York City Police Department put it on their web page and very quickly, Larry DePrimo was vaulted to fame. This was a remarkable act that people responded to very strongly. Now, perhaps it wouldn't have been as surprising if we'd learned that the man who he was helping was actually his nephew. And we'd say, well, from an evolutionary perspective, that makes sense in terms of inclusive fitness. And it wouldn't have been as surprising, perhaps, if we'd learned that the man who he helped was an old friend who had helped him in the past. And we might simply say, well, this is reciprocal altruism. But what was shocking about this was that they'd never met before. And our question is then, what's the payoff in these kinds of interactions? If we've learned about models that can explain why we might help friends and friends help us and why we might help our families, um, what's the explanation for what's going on in this case? And the argument's been developed that this is what's called indirect reciprocity. And indirect reciprocity refers to the payback coming from others who observe a cooperative act on our part. And indeed, this New York City Police Department image of Larry DePrimo helping the homeless man received 513,000 likes on Facebook within two or three days. That's a big payoff. So we've distinguished in the course of this discussion between two reciprocities, and let's make that more clear now. In direct reciprocity, the benefits flow directly back and forth between two partners. So orange assists blue and blue reciprocates and assists orange. In indirect reciprocity, the benefits flow from outside observers and they're ultimately benefits to our reputation. So in this case, let's say that orange benefits blue and blue never reciprocates. So maybe the orange smiley face, this is Larry DePrimo, and the blue smiley face is the homeless man. And instead, the benefits come from third parties who observe this, and based on this, they hold orange in good reputation. Larry DePrimo's reputation becomes strong. But are there limits to this? Are there limits to what's called indirect reciprocity and do they parallel the limits that we found with Hamilton's rule in direct reciprocity and the answer is yes and this turns on how many people actually have any kind of accurate knowledge about our character and our behavior so how many people accurately know our reputation and that's the big question that applies to indirect reciprocity and as you might expect now, Martin Nowak has come up with a simple formula that captures this.
And in this formula, Q stands for the probability that other people have accurate knowledge of your reputation. And in this case, then Q has to be greater than the cost-benefit ratio. And we're right back where we were in some ways with direct reciprocity. And obviously in the age of mass media, in some individual cases, gaining our 15 minutes of fame can expand our reputation. But for most of us, it's going to be a fairly small number of people who have anything like accurate knowledge about our character. Now let's consider indirect reciprocity again in the context of a foraging camp. So here again, think about a Hadza camp that has some 30 individuals in it. And what's the likelihood that they'll have accurate knowledge about the behavior of one another and, and accurate knowledge of the reputation of one another? But if we consider, again, a large metropolitan area and two strangers pass by one another, what's the likelihood that they'll have that kind of knowledge about one another? And indeed, we'd expect this to be low, and a scandal broke out in the aftermath of the NYPD Altra story when other reporters reported that the homeless man was not in fact homeless, and then the follow-up story reported that he took the boots and he sold them for cash. He explained that it wasn't safe for him to be wearing boots that cost that much money out on the street that somebody might murder him for his boots. So there's two roads to cooperation. Uh, one of these is inclusive fitness, the other is reciprocity. And we can think about reciprocity in two forms, direct reciprocity and indirect reciprocity. And whichever form we use, these two roads to cooperation appear to work best when we're in small scale human communities where people interact frequently, have a lot of relatives and have knowledge about one another's reputations. Thank you for listening.